Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to have everyone out tonight. It's uh, certainly a pleasure to have uh, Rufus Clifford and his wife, Carrie, from South Carolina with us tonight. And we certainly appreciate your effort in getting here tonight. Looking around, we it's this time of year, we probably got a lot of people out at this time and, uh, with, with Thanksgiving, and hopefully we'll have more tomorrow morning. We meet again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock for our Bible study and 10 o'clock for our worship service. Just a note about those that are sick. My wife is not feeling well. And, and McKinley, uh, Rusty's daughter, uh, was involved on a wreck, uh, with a wreck on the, on the bridge this afternoon. And I don't know anything about the status at that time. Maybe before the service is over, we'll, we'll hear something on that. Uh, David... Uh, Griffin will be uh, leading uh, our singing tonight. Our opening prayer is Mark Huber, and the closing prayer is Kevin, and Ron is on the AV. Are there any other announcements that I need to make at this time? David? Oh, one other one. To make the Sunday maybe a little bit better, uh, if you would, everybody needs to focus. Well, good evening. Well, in order of service, we'll have uh, two songs. We'll have our opening prayer. We'll have another uh, two songs, and we'll have our uh, lesson by Brother Clifford, and then we'll have our invitation song right after that. First song tonight is Majesty. All songs are from the Hymns for Worship songbook. They are displayed. <coughs>
I'm sure, like us, everyone here has had a wonderful week being with their loved ones and seeing them and probably eating more food than you intended to eat, like me, but I enjoyed it. And uh, it's good to see this number here. We're glad to be here. We appreciate so much the invitation to come and be with you by the elders, and we appreciate the beautiful place, the hotel we're staying at. They have some wonderful food there, too. It's good. And Carrie and I are excited to be here. We've been looking forward to it. We're looking forward to getting to know y'all this weekend better while we're here, if the Lord wills. Without a doubt, most of us would all agree that America is the best country that one could live in. In fact, people try to get into our country, not just legally, but they try to get into it illegally. I have some statistics I thought was interesting. The U.S. Citizenship Immigration Services welcomed 7.4 million naturalized citizens into the fabric of our nation. In other words, they became U.S. citizens. Then I saw in 2021, 809,100 people became citizens of the United States. Now, if you talk to these people, to them, that is a great privilege. It is an honor, and, I, and rightly so. I'm glad to be a citizen of the U.S. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But you know what's better 
than being a citizen of the United States. That's being a citizen of the kingdom. In other words, being a Christian. And I want to notice tonight, for a few minutes, the privilege of being a Christian because when we obey the gospel, we know we're added to the Lord's church, but just as those people who became American citizens they realize how fortunate they are. I think sometimes we, as Christians, forget what a privilege it is to be in a relationship with the creator of all that is, was, or ever will be. And someone may say, well, what type of relationship do, do Christians have? I want to share some thoughts with you on this. If you're a Christian, you're in a close and dear relationship with God. Now, we know according to Isaiah, and this is the King James translation, according to Isaiah, before we became Christians, sin is what was the barrier between God and us. Isaiah said in the long ago, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. He said, Neither is there heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And just think back before you became a Christian. Walking in darkness. Remember, you knew you were lost. You knew you needed to do something. I tell you, it was hard for me to sleep back then when I reached that certain age and I knew I had sinned and I knew I needed to get right with God. And what's interesting is, because of God's love, of course, we know this, most Christians do, we're brought back to God by Jesus. Paul, through the Spirit, Romans 5, 1 and 2, he said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith, <clears throat> excuse me, by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But if you go on to verses 8 and 11, we're told, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. Then in verse 10 and 11, he says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And we all know what it means to be reconciled. You're brought back into a right relationship. And not only so, but also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And so because of Jesus and his willingness to obey God and his love for God and you and me, we're able to be justified, made righteous, and be in this close and dear relationship. You ever noticed how people will put great emphasis on what family a person comes from? Have you ever heard someone say that? Well, he comes from or she comes from a well-known family, a prestigious family. Well, if we're a Christian, we're in the greatest family. Matter of fact, John said in 1 John 3, 1, he said, But behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. So we're in the family of God, where, according to Ephesians 1, 3, which means we're in Christ. Notice what it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, we're in Christ. So we're in the greatest family that a person could be in upon this earth if we are a Christian. But not only is it a close and dear relationship, it's a sure relationship. Now, sometimes in order to get a study, maybe you've done this, you'll talk to someone and in your conversation you can ask them, well, if you died today, would you go to heaven? I had a conversation recently with a repairman that came to our house, and I asked him that question, and he said, no, I wouldn't. And I'll tell you, that's sad. And I got excited because, man, I know I'm going to help him out. 
And I asked him, well, let's study. I can show you how to get to heaven. He, he didn't want to. But what's even sadder to me is so many Christians, I see this a lot of times, especially in older Christians, they, you ask them, well, are you excited about one day going to heaven? It's better on the other side. And they'll go, well, I hope I make it. Or uh, I've committed so many sins in my life. I, I just don't know if I'm going to make it to heaven. And to me, that's sad because the Bible tells us we can know whether or not we're going to go to heaven. In 1 John 5, 13, John here says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Of course, in another place, he says, We have eternal life in promise. In other words, it's coming. Peter made a reference to this in 1 Peter 1. 3 and 4, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But look at verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So I'm a Christian, you're a Christian. We have this confident assurance of this living hope. It says it's reserved. Now, today, when I drove here, Brother Griffin had sent me an email showing the reservation over at the hotel. And maybe you've made reservations before at a restaurant. And sometimes you'll go to the, your reservation at a hotel or a restaurant, and people make mistakes. And they'll say, well, we don't, we don't have you here. We gave your room away, or we gave your seat away. But see, that's the beauty with God. It's reserved there. God, Titus 1, 2, he doesn't lie. And so we don't have to worry. Now, I mentioned those who became citizens of the United States. When a person makes the decision to become a citizen of the United States and they meet the requirements, then they're accepted. But did you know that some people renounce their citizenship? I'm sure you did. I got curious about that. In 2020, 6,707 people said, I don't want to be a citizen of the United States anymore. And I thought, wow. Just imagine what they're giving up by doing that. But when you think about it, Christians make a choice. A person makes a choice to become a Christian, but they can also choose to leave the Christian life, can't they? And that, that is sad. So what we have to understand is, why, while it is a sure relationship, it is conditioned, conditional. Colossians 1, 21 and 23, Paul points out, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And then there's this little word that we learn early in life, if. That's, a, that's a word, one little word in it, but it means so much. He says, if, if what? If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, I mentioned so many of those Christians that I've met in my life, that wonder, are they actually going to make it to heaven? And I'll try to talk to them, and maybe you've run into people like that. And what I've found is most of the time, they don't understand not only the privileges they enjoy by being a Christian, they don't understand the three concepts of sin taught in the Bible. And when you look at this, and we have to understand, Ephesians 2.1, first there's the alien sinner. Remember the Bible talks about how we're walking in darkness. That's the way we were before we became a Christian. 
Ephesians 2, 1, it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Remember, we read Isaiah 59. Once we sinned and we reached that age, we knew we transgressed God's law. We knew we had done wrong and we knew what we needed to do and we didn't do it. This is a way of life. Many people like that repairman I was talking about, he wasn't willing to give up this way of life. He's walking in darkness. Paul talked about grace in Romans, the fifth chapter. Remember in Romans 6? They got to thinking, well, if we're living under grace, then we can just sin. And notice what he says, verse 1 and 2. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, just like I don't speak. I have enough trouble with English. I don't speak any foreign language. But fortunately, Vine and Thayer and others do. And continue there is in the present tense. In other words, Paul's saying we, we're not alien sinners anymore. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Did you catch that? Back in Ephesians 2.1, before you're a Christian, you're dead in sin. Paul's saying here, you're dead to sin. Now, if I asked you, are you a law keeper? Most everyone would say, well, yes, Rufus. I, I try to keep the law driving you know, over here tonight. I, I tried to stay within the speed limit. Now, to be honest with you, I didn't see a sign for the speed limit between the hotel and here, so I, I drove pretty slow. But if you ask me if I'm a law keeper, I'm going to say, sure, I'm a law keeper. Am I a perfect law keeper? No. There are times I fall short. Sometimes a song, will, I like Elvis. I tell people I don't like his life and the way he lives, but I like his music. And when certain songs come on, if I'm not careful, I exceed the recommended speed limit. So I'm not a perfect law keeper. But I'll tell you what, I'm not, rain, sin doesn't reign in me if I'm a Christian. It doesn't reign in you. It doesn't have dominion over you or me anymore. It does over the alien sinner. So we have to understand we're not lost continuing in sin. So the Bible talks in one reference about the alien sinner. And then there's the way the Christians sin. Paul made reference to the Colossians in Colossians 1.13. He said, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we left the darkness when we obeyed the gospel and we're now in the light. This again is a way of life. And if we're Christians, that's what we're living. We're walking in the light. We make that choice. Every day. Now, the goal is not to sin. John, in 1 John 2, 1, states that. Now, when we're, I'm teaching the book of John. We just started that a couple of weeks ago. And John was facing Gnostics, Gnosticism, the all-knowing one. And really, we have Gnostics today. Gnosticism, basically, they thought that the body was evil. And yet, the soul never sinned. And they claim to have superior knowledge over the apostle. And we have people like that today. They just don't know they're Gnostic. And we're going to, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. But John says here in 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. See, that's the goal. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father of Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, we go back to 1 John. And I have these pronouns underlined and in yellow. Notice what John says, verses 5 through 10. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now notice this. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we, he's including himself, have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Then he states, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But notice 9 and 10. If we 
John's including himself. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So someone says, was John a sinner? Yes. He wasn't a sinner, number one. He wasn't an alien sinner. Just like I'm a sinner, but I'm not continuing in sin. I'm not walking in darkness. Let's say, remember when you obeyed the gospel? I don't know if you remember this commercial years ago with the owl licking the little lollipop. I always use that example. How many licks does it take, I think it was, to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll? It was bubble gum or something in there, wasn't it? But anyway, that owl never could make it. Sometimes people will ask, well, how, how often do Christians sin? Well, it varies, doesn't it? God appeals to us on our spiritual side. Satan appeals to us on our fleshly side. But let's say you obey the gospel. You're doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden, boom, you do something. Because you're not perfect. The devil tempts you and you're weak and you give in to a sin. According to John, what do you do? See, we don't wait to repent. What do we do? We do what he said. We confess the sin to God. And because we're in the family of God, we've already contacted the blood, that blood's available. So all we do is confess it, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Boom, it's gone. I don't have Hebrews 8, 12 up here, but it says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Have you ever had somebody bring up something that you did long ago? Now, God's forgiven you for it, but someone remembers it, and they bring it up. See, that's not the way it's going to be with God. It is gone. And that's something that I've had to work with years ago in my life, and I still have to fight with it. And I know a lot of Christians do this. Once we ask God to forgive us, he says he's going to forgive us. But we have to forgive ourselves. And some of these older people I've talked to, they're coming to the end of their journey in life, and I have to remind them of this. I'll say, well, you repented of that, didn't you? Yes. Well, God forgave you. You've got to forgive yourself. So what I used to do, I found I would do, instead of asking God to forgive me for the same sin ten times in a row, you ever do that? I would say I would ask God to forgive me the first time, and then after that, when I popped back in my mind, I would say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me for that sin. But then you go along again, you're doing pretty good, what happens? Boom, you sin. Well, you do, you pray. I used to work with a guy who was a Baptist, and they would say, well, man, I'm once saved, always saved. You're, you're lost one minute and saved the next. I'd say, no, I'm walking in the light. I'm under the grace system. All I have to do is repent. You come along here, boom. You pray, God forgives you. Now, that's not a license to sin, that's, Paul's already covered that. And then one other time, boom, there you go. You ask him, and he forgives you. You've got to forgive yourself. That's the privilege of being a Christian. But then the Bible talks about the fact that some can choose to go back into a life of sin. In other words, you know people and I know people that sin, they're Christians, and they don't repent. They stay in that sin. It's nothing new. 2 Peter 2, 20-22 says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Peter says, it for, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her own wallowing in the mire. Now, there's the way the alien sinner sins, walking in darkness, that's the way of life. The Christian, we explain, that's the way of life. The third way is Jesus, sinless perfection. And we all know that Jesus never sinned. First Peter 
tells us, 1 Peter 1, 2, 21 through 22 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. He did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Now I've known people who claim, just like in John's day, Gnostics, they'll say, well, I don't have to repent. They'll say, it's called the windshield wiper effect. They'll say, my body sins, but my soul is as pure as Jesus, imputed righteousness. Calvinism teaches that. The Bible doesn't. But man-made doctrine does. And that's what John was battling. And then some people say, well, it's possible to live a sinless, perfect life. I ran into a Christian in another place in Tennessee one time where I was worshiping, a young man, and he believed that once he became a Christian, since he was born of God, I think it was 1 John 3, 8 was the verse he used, it says there, born of God does not commit sin. And he said, so I never sin anymore. <laughs> well, when you think about that, I said, so you don't sin anymore, huh? And I had to explain to him, again, you look back at other verses, commit means you don't, it's present tense, you're not continuing in sin, as we discussed. And so, some people say, well, if I put forth enough effort, I'll, I can never sin again. Well, see, I have a problem with that because I deny that the Bible's going to tell me to do something that I can't do. And I'm human, you're human. That's the beauty of the grace system, the remedial system. And we have to understand, even Paul, I mentioned John, but 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul said, but I keep under my body, Some, he buffeted it, and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So as a Christian, I'm to strive not to sin. That's the goal. I want to be as much like Christ as I can. But the fact remains is I'm human, and I'm going to fall short. You're going to fall short. And I need the blood of Jesus. I need grace. And I have to go and repent that sin. And the Bible teaches, as long as I'm walking in the light, and you're walking in the light, and we repent of the sin, God forgives us. Now, this is an ongoing process. Now, it gets easier, but the devil's always out there, isn't he? 1 Peter 5, 8. He's going to find another way to get to you, another way to get to me. But we have the blood of Jesus, and we have to keep on keeping on. We're in a relationship with God, and it's a privilege. And God says he'll forgive you, and I believe it because God said it. Now, I want to leave you with this. Just as a person has to choose to become an American citizen before they can enjoy the privileges that U.S. citizens enjoy, one has to make the decision to become a Christian before you can enjoy the privileges of being in Christ. And it's not hard to do. Since the day of Pentecost, anyone that's ever wanted to obey the gospel has been told to do the same thing, depending on where they were on their road to salvation. But when you take the totality of it, they all heard the word, they believed it, they repented of their sin, confessed Jesus to be the Son of God, and they were buried in the waters of baptism. But that's just the beginning. That's just the start. And you have to remain faithful. You're walking in the light, but you have to continue to remain faithful. And when you fall short, that blood is there, as we mentioned. Ask God to forgive you. Then forgive yourself. That's how you go to sleep at night without having rocks in your pillows, as my granddaddy used to say. And it's a comforting feeling to be a child of God. And we need to realize what a privilege it truly is. I want to leave you with this story tonight before we sing this song. Years ago, there was a man in a village. He was an old wise man. And everyone knew he had the answers to everything. Well, this whippersnapper, as my mom and dad used to call young people sometimes, 
he, he thought he was going to trick the old man. So what he did is he got a bird and he put it in his hand. And he went and he approached the old wise man. And he said, yes, can I help you? He said, yes. He said, I want you to tell me, is the bird in my hand alive or is the bird in my hand dead? And what he was going to do is, if the wise man said, well, my son, the bird's alive, he was going to squeeze that bird and go, nope, he's dead. But if he said, well, the bird's dead, my son, he was just going to open his hands and let it fly away. He thought he had it. So he's sitting there, he said, tell me, is he alive or is he dead? And the wise man just kind of smiled and he said, my son, the bird is in your hand. And I like that because tonight, your soul is in your hand. God has done his part. Jesus has done his part. The Holy Spirit has done his. If you're not a Christian, all that's left is for you to do yours. And if we can help you do that, as Brother Dave leads us in this song, if you need to get right with the Lord, I would encourage you not to put it off. Do it tonight as we stand and sing. Have I not led your good death to the cross? Was my heart safe trip you gave each of us here tonight and we pray that you'd be with us on our journeys home we ask that you bless brother Clifford while he's here this weekend him and his wife Carrie and we ask that you be with him and present him the words to say and we ask that you continue to be with Whitney throughout her pregnancy that she may deliver a healthy baby, and we ask that you continue to be with those who were mentioned as sick. We ask that you watch over and care for us, forgive us when we sin. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.